but we are also tremendously honored to have with us Dr. Wayne Frederick, um, a distinguished son of Trinidad and Tobago, who currently serves as the president of Howard University. Dr. Frederick has held this position since, 20, since July 2014. He previously served as Howard's provost and chief academic officer. He's a distinguished researcher and surgeon. Dr. Frederick continues, and I'm not quite sure how you do that, sir. He continues to work as a surgeon and to lecture to medical students and residents at Howard's School of Medicine. Dr. Frederick is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and belongs to numerous surgical organizations, including the American Surgical Association. His medical research seeks to narrow the disparity in all cancer care outcomes with a focus on gastrointestinal cancers. He is the author of many peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, abstracts, and editorials. He's a member of the boards of Humana, Mutual of America, and the United States Chamber of Commerce. He also serves as a member of the NCCA Division I Presidential Forum and chairs the Mideastern Athletic Conference, as well as the Consortium of Universities of the Washington Metropolitan Area. As the 17th president, uh, Dr. Frederick's goal is to enhance Howard University's legacy, ensure that the university maximizes its impact and that its students receive a well-rounded educational experience. Through his experience as a scholar and another as an administrator, Dr. Frederick strives to develop innovative approaches to focus on the institutional priorities of his beloved alma mater and support the success of his students. Dr. Frederick, welcome, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate uh, the introduction. Dr. Frederick, welcome, sir. I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation in the interest of time to make sure that uh, you have an opportunity to ask questions. I have more slides than I need. Um, and so I'm going to uh, do my best to uh, make sure that uh, I use I use the time um, appropriately. And again, thanks very much for uh, the invitation and having me. So uh, um, what I'm charged with today is to speak to the fact that higher education can be an agent of social and economic change. And uh, Labor Day in Trinidad is, um, in Trinidad and Tobago is extremely important uh, to me uh, for the obvious reasons around the issues uh, that brought it about and the issues that it still stands for. But also today is um, my grandmother's birthday and she turns 96. And so it certainly is a pleasure uh, to spend this time here uh, with you. Uh, with that in mind, for those of you who don't know Howard University well, uh, Howard University is the only federally chartered, historically black college and university in the US. And some people uh, take the liberty to refer to it as the flagship um, institution. Uh, Howard uh, is named after General Oliver Otis Howard, who was one of 17 men um, who decided uh, to start this university to serve freed slaves moving from the South uh, to the North. And he became Howard's third president. And as you can see in this uh, picture, uh, lost his right arm uh, in the Civil War, was an abolitionist, and we remain grateful. Howard University is very unusual in terms of American universities as well, especially American universities that were started uh, in the 1800s or before. Most of these were started as seminaries and Howard was actually started as a university from day one. Uh, this gentleman here, Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, uh, there have been 17 presidents at Howard, uh, with, with myself being the 17th. Uh, he was the first African-American president and he came to Howard in 1926 and, and really uh, transformed the university. As you can see, uh, none of the schools were accredited at that time. Uh, enrollment of about 1,700 students, and he transformed that by 1950 and, and had 6,000 students, all of the schools fully accredited, and really just grew this into uh, the academic institution it is today with 13 schools and colleges, nine in the academic affairs area, and four uh, in the health sciences area. We have over 6,000 employees, 
uh, including over a thousand faculty. Uh, we sit on about 250 acres on a main campus where we have two other uh, sites uh, in the district as well. And we have one in Maryland uh, as well, where we have a major research lab uh, at present. We also have a, uh, a Howard University Hospital, which uh, again is another unique um, institution uh, for a higher ed uh, university as part of our complex. Uh, we also own our own TV station and our own radio station as well. So this really is a very uh, complicated uh, institution. Uh, historically, black colleges and universities are unique in higher ed uh, in America. They don't necessarily exist um, elsewhere in predominantly white societies. So I'll take a, a moment to spend some time just to uh, talk about what uh, this, this group of institutions represent. Uh, we have about 300,000 students that attend our HBCUs. 80% uh, of the population is African-American. And we represent about three to four percent of all the four-year institutions in this country. Uh, however, we are responsible for the awarding of 21 percent of the bachelor's degrees awarded to African Americans. Uh, the other interesting thing about these institutions is that they actually uh, was an act passed in Congress uh, to identify these institutions. You had to have a mission. So, for instance, today, uh, because of the way historically black colleges and universities uh, were identified, if someone were to create a university today um, to get it, to have it um, be pronounced as a historically black college and university would not work because of the way that law in particular um, is set up. But as you can see here, uh, some of them actually have a majority enrollment of white students because over time uh, their populations uh, change. I, I think the role that these institutions play is absolutely critical to American life and American culture. And I would even say globally as well, as I'll point out to you uh, as we go along here. 34% uh, of African-Americans who receive bachelor's degrees in physics, chemistry, astronomy, mathematics, and biology, the classic STEM uh, disciplines actually came from HBCUs. Uh, when you, as I said, 22% of all of the degrees granted to African-Americans, but I want you to pay attention down here, 40% of the black members of Congress uh, attended HBCUs. 12.5% of the CEOs uh, who are African-American attended HBCUs. 40% of the engineers uh, that are African-American attended HBCUs. 50% of the professors at non-HBCUs uh, actually attended an HBCU. And 50% of the lawyers and remarkably 80% of the judges, including uh, the, when you look at the first Supreme Court justice who was African-American, Thurgood Marshall, uh, was a Howard alum. Uh, this shows the outsized impact that a Howard University has. Uh, in between 2002 and, two, and 2011, Howard University sent more African American students to get STEM HB, to, to get STEM PhDs at institutions all around this country than the combined total sent by Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Yale, and uh, combined, or roughly about the same. And that just goes to show you these four institutions, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and Yale, have a combined endowment of ex in excess of $100, million, $100 billion. Howard University's endowment is about $750 million. So we certainly punch well above our weight. And this can be broken down into different fields. And you'll see that Howard is near the top in almost every field. When you look at African Americans who apply to medical school, Howard University sends more than any other institution. And over the course of history of medical education in this country, we've actually um, taught and graduated more African-American physicians than any one single country uh, in the United States. So we have gone about approaching how we look at getting people into the workforce, how we look at labor, and, and what the preparation a university must do uh, for the labor force uh, from a very different perspective. Uh, I believe in experiential learning. I think it's a valuable tool. I think immersive experiences uh, really elevate uh, that opportunity. And so that's what we've tried to combine. Sometimes uh, what we have done in the past historically is really stood up internships where students may go and get a certain experience, but we have not tied that as much as uh, we should have in the past 
it, uh, in terms of their academics and really have them being taught the didactic material. So the traditional workforce development, when you look at labor force as student recruitment, job acquisition, uh, new employee investments, such as training and acclimation. And most employers will tell you that what then happens is once that person acquires the skills in this area here and the confidence, they then depart. Uh, some may choose to remain. And so it's not, it, it's not I think, a, a good uh, spend of dollars in this area right here. Uh, so what we have tried to do is develop a new model. And what we've tried to look at is identifying academic and technical needs in both the workforce and uh, in our student body. We've tried to align those academic offerings to ensure that uh, there is some alignment there. And then we've targeted immersive experiences where the students can actually be within uh, the environment and that field of study being prepared and getting on the job training as well. And I think what we've started to see already is increased retention and as well from um, employers, they get the best selection uh, of the type of person that they would want. So diversifying the tech workforce is an example of this. Um, we have a middle school on our campus, which is a, a charter school. 95% um, of those students are African-American. And uh, most of the students coming in actually will be will performing below their grade level. 10% of them actually had learning disabilities coming in. This school has been remarkable. Uh, what has happened uh, with this institution is that now 95% of the students who come to us uh, to this middle school go on to college and about 60% of them actually uh, enter STEM disciplines with about 88% of them receiving scholarships. And that initial early exposure we think is critical. So I do think when we look at the workforce and we look at higher education in particular, one of the things that we must do a better job of is reaching back and reaching back as far as our middle school, but also our high school. Howard University has a dual enrollment program um, with a, a few uh, school, public school systems in the area. And I just wonder, uh, as I have built this program out myself and see how well students excel in this environment, uh, if we offer the opportunity uh, for high school students to take online courses, for instance, offered by Howard and earn college credit as one possibility. Another possibility is for them to do that with the higher ed institutions um, in the country. When I think of my own, um, when I think of my own experience um, at St. Mary's College, and I think of what I learned at A level, and certainly you get um, advanced placement credits here in the U.S. for that, I still think that there was an opportunity maybe as a fourth former and fifth former to be earning college credit uh, because I think the public school system in Trinidad has such a, a rigorous uh, curriculum and there's an opportunity there. Uh, we started a, a cash STEM scholars program. Again, my philosophy has been to truncate, truncate the matriculation as much as possible. This is an expensive venture to come to university, but I think that we can expedite what students do. And so a few years ago, I started a STEM scholars program in which students interested in a STEM PhD coming in from high school uh, could enroll uh, in a rigorous program that would get them both their undergraduate degree and their PhD in no more than seven years total. And so we've really um, been pushing this. We've had great success. You can see the students here are absolutely excellent. Average SAT scores are very high. GP is very high. Uh, ACT scores as well, very high. Good mix of men and women. When we look at the African-American male uh, in the US today, that's part of the concern that we have. We've also included a study abroad component um, as well, because we think it's important for students uh, to also get an exposure. And several of these young people you see in this picture here, uh, who went to Berlin in 2018, actually uh, came to Howard without even a passport. Uh, this is another cohort at my house. Um, I host them for uh, a cookout as well. Um, these young people, their social conscientiousness is absolutely incredible. But the fact that we will change the landscape of what the PhD field looks like and what MD PhDs look like in America by browning that entire industry is what is going to be remarkable about this. Sending a cohort of students out like this every 10 years, I think, 
uh, would be a remarkable um, experience. We've also started a pre-health summer enrichment program in which we invite our other HBCUs. We've done this with the law, pre-law program and pre-PhD. These students come and spend the summer with us, um, including this summer, they'll do that virtually because of the pandemic, uh, but it's to expose them to uh, pre-med, getting them ready uh, for what's next and, and making sure that they can take the entrance exams and do well and also um, give them some exposure to what they will see at a professional school level. And why is this important? It's important because when you look at some of these industries, and one example here is when you look at computer science and look at uh, white males in computer science versus every other demographic group, um, we certainly have to and must do better. So we started a program, uh, started as Howard West, is now known as the Tech Exchange, um, and we looked at African-Americans make up only 1% of the tech workforce. And so when I went to Google, I made the uh, proposal to Google that they take my students uh, there for a summer. Um, they would get 12 credits worth of work, but all of the classes, machine learning, computer science, um, artificial intelligence, would be taught by Google engineers and Howard faculty. So students could get the cutting edge experience. And now that we've expanded it, we've included other HBCUs as well as Hispanic serving institutions. Um, we've since expanded it as well. And this is another area where I would love to see some opportunities extended uh, to students from Trinidad and Tobago as well, because I think this experience and, and exposure is absolutely incredible. The faculty as well uh, from Howard go out to Google uh, to participate in the teaching. And again, I think it would be great um, if we can bring uh, students and faculty members from Trinidad and Tobago as well to participate in this. More than 50% of the first cohort received job offers and 75% of them were offers in Silicon Valley. So again, we do this over the course of 10 uh, to, to 20 years, we will totally change it. And, and when you look at uh, Google in particular, Google is also run by Sundar Pichai. He's um, originally from India and you see some of his um, data here. I, I mentioned this because the other thing that I think is important for us to recognize when we look at some of these activities is that there's a lot of synergy in terms of where you meet people and what they are about. And as you can imagine, being from India, we had a fairly extensive discussion about cricket and Brian Lara, for whom he's a significant fan. And, and I think that what you're seeing in the tech industry in the US as well is a population at the CEO level um, of a lot of foreign born uh, nationals. Uh, we have an HU Advanced grant that focuses on getting more women faculty um, in STEM. And this has been, uh, I think, extremely important to us as well. We've extended this into the entertainment area. We've launched a Howard Entertainment program in which our students are out um, in Hollywood with Amazon Studios making films, again, getting the practical and didactic instruction. And the reason we've done that is because if you turn your television on any night of the week, um, Netflix, stream, you could, anywhere you go, you can't avoid uh, my Howard alum. Um, everybody from Suzanne Kalechi Watson on This Is Us uh, to Debbie Allen and her sister, Felicia Rashad, um, they're all uh, Howard alum. Anthony Anderson is, Chadwick Boseman, the Black Panther, who I had as my commencement speaker, Sean Coombs, who was my classmate and uh, also my commencement speaker um, as well, Taraji uh, Henson and Laz Alonzo. Um, and Marlon Wayans. They all are, are Howard alum. And so we have a pipeline, but it would be great for us to be on the other side of the camera and making these movies as well. And that's what we're working on. Um, we've also developed a very strong relationship with uh, Steph Curry, who has a production company and produced the movie Manuel about the unfortunate murders of nine uh, parishioners in that church in South Carolina uh, a few years ago and uh, had him over and he now also has invested in our golf program uh, as an aside. Uh, the other thing that I think is important is to get faculty out of the classroom. Um, and, you know, speaking to Labor College, uh, I might be speaking to, might be preaching to the choir here, but what we've tried to do here at Howard is to have faculty externships as well. So we've sent faculty into industries. So we've sent them, for instance, to MasterCard. We've had them observe um, what MasterCard is doing, what our interns are learning, how they're learning, and then they're able to assess whether the curriculum that we have 
how robust it is. They also give MasterCard feedback on what the internship looks like, uh, what changes can be made, and I think that that has been very helpful. Howard has a next-gen project that is set up with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce as well, and this allows my students to get a very broad um, uh, view of what these industries look like, what the legislative process around business may look like um, as well. And again, I think the opportunity is there given the extensive reach of the government uh, in Trinidad and Tobago in terms of industries to get an exposure uh, to students. We have what's called an inclusive innovation incubator at Howard. And I think this is important for small businesses and entrepreneurs um, who would like to launch uh, their business or expand their business. Um, you can come into this area with your business plan, have it evaluated. We um, rent space for people who may not necessarily have an office just yet uh, to set up and, and to think through what they would like to do. We have um, video conferencing capabilities as well. So uh, for those businesses that are just getting going, uh, you get exposure to quite a bit, uh, get law and accounting services as well. Um, embedded in there. And again, when you look at the workforce and you look at what small businesses contribute uh, to most economies, including the one in Trinidad and Tobago, this is a great opportunity, I think, for universities to take the lead on bringing them in and giving them the opportunity uh, for exposure. I also think it's important to leverage technology anywhere we can. And we've done that with medicine. And we've tried to tie that uh, to the local community. So this is an event I was at um, very recently in which we were, we stood up a coronavirus uh, testing center uh, at a church. Uh, and we did this with support uh, of a million dollar grant from Bank of America. This is the second site we've put in a predominantly African-American neighborhood, especially given the disparities of our outcome. And I think again, our universities should participate in social change and this is one way we can. When there are things like pandemics uh, and social unrest in the society, our universities should be at the forefront um, of solutions. Interprofessional education, I also think is important. We tend to have very siloed um, universities as a construct. And what I've tried to do is to try to break that down. So everything from dentistry to um, our med medical faculty, our nursing and allied health pharmacy, We've tried to set up an interprofessional education to do that. The technology is important. Uh, my wife and I have uh, given a gift uh, to underwrite a part of the simulation center at Howard University. And I think that uh, the use of technology in terms of how we learn and train going forward, uh, I think is, is critical. Um, these are very expensive robots that are in, uh, in there. We have a, a robot by the name of Noel um, who is wrapped in a, a, a pregnant, uh, mannequin body, um, delivers babies, et cetera, and training students, uh, medical students, nurses, um, et cetera, in this setting really can get people comfortable. Um, you can simulate a variety of uh, different uh, circumstances as well. And I think that that is going to make for much better uh, physicians and healthcare workers as we go forward. You can see the students here. Uh, with an endoscope uh, basically doing a colonoscopy and you can see them looking at uh, the images there as they, they go through that. Um, there have been generations of social and economic change makers. Uh, Howard University was involved in Brown versus the Board of Education. This is Thurgood Marshall in the center here and this gentleman here is James Neighbor. Um, Thurgood Marshall, who was originally from Baltimore, uh, would come to Howard University and then subsequently uh, be named the first African-American to be named to the Supreme Court. Um, James Nabret, who was the dean of uh, the law school at Howard, the secretary of the university, and then subsequently became the president of the university in the 1960s. Uh, these two men uh, were major architects uh, of getting uh, Brown versus Board of Education to the Supreme Court. And that resulted in the desegregation of uh, educate of the entire education system in America. And these are the types of things where the university should participate. The Dean of the Howard Law School at that time, Charles Hamilton Houston, often said that uh, people who come to the law school should be social engineers. And he had a saying where he would often refer to people in society that you could either be a parasite or a social engineer. 
and a parasite would be one that just did not participate in bringing about change. Uh, now, the contemporary experience of the Brown versus the Board of Education, although that desegregated our schools, one of the reasons you see such talk about systemic racism and social unrest in the US is because in 2019, one of the things that we discovered is that more than half of the nation, um, this has really taken hold. So although there's a law in the books, our behavior as a society has moved away from that. And Howard University has been a place uh, for social change. People from Tanahasi Coates, um, you know, to Ambassador Andrew Young, who was also the mayor of Atlanta, uh, Patricia Harris, all of these men and women have come to Howard University to engineer change. Tony Morrison, uh, Jesse Norman, et cetera. And so Howard has a rich history uh, of producing people who go out and attempt to really change the industry and the society. Um, one of them I would mention is Stokely Carmichael. He was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad in 1941. Uh, earned his uh, BA degree in 1964, was a major part of the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee known as SNCC. And they played an important role in the civil rights movement uh, in terms of really activating protests and so on. And he would go on to be an international activist. The Honorable Eric Williams, uh, born in Port of Spain, Trinidad in 1911, as you would know, went to the University of Oxford and decided that he needed to come to Howard because he felt that Howard University was a black Oxford. Became a faculty member in the political science department. And in many ways, I think, uh, based on uh, writings that I've read that we still have here uh, in our library from him, really put together a lot of uh, what he saw in terms of breaking down colonialism and bringing about a free and independent nation and obviously would go on to become Prime Minister uh, of Trinidad. Today, we find ourselves in an area of social unrest, and these are students and residents who are training at Howard Hospital, who came outside and took a knee for eight minutes and 46 seconds uh, to honor the life of George Floyd. And while we talk about George Floyd, he represents uh, many African-Americans who have been murdered by police, and it is a a symptom of a wider issue of systemic racism. And that social change that must be brought about must be brought about by these young people. Ultimately, where they practice medicine, how they practice medicine, how they engage with the society around them uh, is where that uh, change is going to occur. This lady to the left here uh, is my mother. Uh, she practiced nursing in Trinidad and Tobago for 51 years. Um, her dedication to public health in Trinidad is a major part of what has always inspired me. And the fact that she always felt that the part, the main thing that she needed to do was to give back to others was, was key. This gentleman to the right here is Dr. LaSalle LaFall, my mentor, who unfortunately passed last year at the age of 89. And he grew up uh, in Florida, um, would go to Florida, a, uh, what was then known as Florida, uh, a and M College, now known as Florida A and M University. He would graduate at the age of eighteen with one B on his transcript, but couldn't take, couldn't get into medical school anywhere. At the time, he could only apply to two black medical schools. And fortunately, his university president would petition the then university president at Howard uh, to get him into Howard's med school. He would graduate number one in his class and go on to become the first black president of the American College of Surgeons, and so many other things that he did. I mentioned him because his mentorship of me was critical and has, uh, has been a major influence in terms of our career. He's a surgical oncologist, um, uh, like I am, and he had a saying about providing hope uh, to patients, which is the anticipation of tomorrow. And that is what I think our higher ed institutions should be about, providing hope. That anticipation of tomorrow to young minds is critical, and we must do that in a robust fashion. This gentleman in the middle here is Charles Drew. And uh, he would die tragically in the last class that he taught, Dr. LaFall sat in the first row. He was our chair of surgery uh, before his death on April 1, 1950. And he had a saying, which is highlighted here, that excellence of performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. And I think that at the end of the day, regardless of what we do within our higher ed institutions, it must be underscored by excellence. And they represented that. 
I was able to host President Barack Obama in 2016 um, for our commencement address. And I am reminded of his uh, speech on that day, especially in this moment in time that we are in. And one of the themes of his address was that you have to own your own blackness and you have to be the individual person that you are within the construct of the society that you're embedded, always looking to push for change, always looking to make it better for others. And I think that that's important. Uh, this young woman is a graduate of my law school, Senator Kamala Harris. Um, I do hope uh, that she is a vice president uh, She's a, she's a vice president contender uh, come this fall, and that would be absolutely uh, glass uh, ceiling breaking in many ways. And I was also happy to host her as my commencement speaker. So as I close, I want us to think about this. Um, I think this slide depicts how I see some of the barriers and where higher ed should be placed. We can certainly try to create equality and give everybody um, the same thing. But we have to recognize that everybody starts from a different place. And so we could create equity by giving those who need more help, more help and not necessarily supporting those who don't. But ultimately, what we should be seeking is justice. And what we should be seeking to do is to remove the barriers. So rather than put blocks up for people to see the game, what we should do is take the barrier away so that we all can see it regardless of where our station is. And I think our higher ed institutions is critical that we do that in this moment. So these two young people are the future of academia is my hope. This is my son here and my daughter. And as I close, I wanna remind all of us that we all have unconscious bias within us. Um, I did this slide and my wife uh, came into the room and gently reminded me that I was giving a talk on unconscious bias. This is the first time I used the slide. As you can tell, my kids were young. Um, in the background here, that is President Obama um, giving his speech in New Hampshire on his way to the Democratic um, nomination. Uh, so this was back in 2008. My son at the time was four years old and my daughter was two. And my wife gently pointed out that my son was dressed in surgical regalia while my daughter was dressed in a sweatshirt like a cheerleader. So this is how I like to end my talks um, on this recognizing that unconscious bias does exist in all of us. And the first thing that we can do to make it a better society is to make sure that we recognize it. So thanks for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Frederick. A very moving and enlightening uh, presentation. There's there's only one shortcoming, sir. Sure. And that is that you went to the wrong school. You went to the one on Frederick Street instead of the one around the Savannah. But that's and I I would leave it there. Um, one of the first question we have up from one of our listeners is, does Howard uh, does Howard have a program in industrial relations, employer relations? And those kinds of things that are that are of interest to 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 some of 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 my um my alumni. Yeah, we 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 don't have um uh we don't have one, but we cover those fields in many areas. Uh, we cover it in sociology and political science and uh, economics. Uh, we cover it in many ways. I'm on the board of the Federal Reserve. Uh, which is like the central bank here. So we set interest rates, et cetera. And one of the programs that we have um, in economics, for instance, is that our students um, and faculty do research and internships at the Federal Reserve Bank, where they get exposure to uh, the employment relations uh, in, into what the labor market does. Department of Labor also tends to hire a large number of those uh, students as well as they look at kind of industrial relations and what that does. Uh, for the movement of employment uh, throughout the United States. Yes. When you talk of social engineering, sometimes um, there are those who give social engineering a, a negative a connotation mm -hmm. that it appears as though you know, an attempt is being made to, to put in a fix rather than allow the, um, rather than allow uh, natural processes to, to take place. How would you respond to that? And I know that is one of the pushbacks that um, 
a lot of conservative people always give, especially in areas of affirmative action and so on. Yeah. You know, I, I think those positions are out of fear, out of fear for, um, you know, upsetting an apple cart that has empowered uh, a certain social class uh, preferentially. And I think uh, what we have to do is to recognize that uh, some of that has to occur in order to make change. You don't start at the same places. Um, you don't afford people the same opportunities. And therefore, those are things that we have to write and we have to, we have to do things to change it. You know, I, I, I tell my kids all the time, um, they are now children of privilege. One generation removed from um, me where I did not have those privileges, right? And I did not have the same opportunities and exposure. They both attend uh, private independent schools. The majority of their friends, um, uh, you know, the children of senators and uh, so on. And so their exposure is very different. They're very comfortable being around Secret Service and that was not something that I grew up uh, understanding. Uh, they're very comfortable walking among uh, halls with people uh, of power. And so they have a different um, concept of it. If we don't make provisions for those who don't have that same privilege and opportunity, uh, then you don't create a Wayne Frederick. You don't create the opportunity for somebody to be born in Trinidad and become the first non-American born president of the flagship um, HBCU in America. It, it, it's nothing, it, it's not that I am exceptional. It is that I had an opportunity um, that was not based on my privilege or statue or my parents' um, financial resources, but it was based on somebody else providing an opportunity. And that's how, you know, that's how I see it. I think it's, it's about leveling that playing field. We have a question, Dr. Frederick, from Mr. Ernest Williams, and he wants you to, um, to, Give us your sense of how you see the post-COVID-19 world with regard, to, especially to education, business, and, uh, and and social social development and social justice. Yeah, you know, but I think it, it, COVID, the, the COVID pandemic uh, is going to do a lot for uh, changing so much of, of who we are and how we do things. Um, everything from how we socialize to how we interpret uh the difficulties in our society uh is going to change there's no doubt about it and to be quite honest it must it absolutely must change we are at a point uh in our history where the globalization and the economics that that globalization brought about um was a, a juice that we were drinking and drinking very very quickly without stopping ourselves long enough to recognize that we needed to be building structures at the same time uh, to avoid things like a pandemic, the globalize the very globalization that has um, really been the economic engine over the past two decades is a very globalization that has made this pandemic uh, a reality. And so now I think what it's going to allow us to do is just kind of step back and uh, reassess where all of those things are and to make sure that we are really building the appropriate structures so that we can maintain pace. The other thing I'd say, this information uh, knowledge that we're in, uh, the, the, in the current society is also one that has occurred with a rapidity that is unmatched. And, and we have to remember that it took 75 years, uh, to get to probably a million users of the telephone and or the car as an example. So in every revolution we've had, whether it was agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, the pace of change was such that the society could adapt. In this information age, the pace of change has is outpacing our ability to adapt. You had a, a, a million followers of Pokemon in about 17 minutes. So if, if you put that in context for how rapidly things are happening, that is something that I think um, we are all now going to step back and realize that we have to build uh, appropriate structures in order to manage the pace of change before we get ahead of ourselves, which to some extent we already have. One of the, um, we hear the, the partnerships, the collaborative partnerships that you've been able to build with industry um, in, in the United States. Um, we hear that um, as someone who was educated in Trinidad and Tobago, and you know, overlay that with your experience in the United States. 
Could you give a perspective on how we can scale some of that vision to the realities that we would have in a, in a small, less developed country? What, what are some practical initiatives that you could perhaps point to? Yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah. So I, I visited Newtown Boys and Girls Primary School as an example. And, um, you know, I, I came home and I said to my wife, you know, they don't have a library. I think we should donate you know, some money to the library, put some books there, et cetera. And then as I stepped back and I thought about it, and I think of the public school system, the very public school system uh, from which I benefited immensely, uh, the public health system uh, from which I benefited immensely as well because I have sickle cell. And, and I think of what those two things did without me having resources to get any type of extra care or any type of lessons, et cetera, it means that there is a fundamental basic provision within the society that's already very strong. And what I think is not happening is that we're not connecting the dots to how we could make those things better. I, I don't see, and, and I, as much as I do pay attention to a lot of what's going on in Trinidad, I'm not underground, so I, I by no means mean this as, speak to this as an authority, but I don't see as much involvement of the higher ed institutions in being part of the solutions for issues that may be occurring. Uh, transportation is, is one of those issues. We look at the number of cars and traffic and potentially what pollution that leads to. I think if the government needs answers to that, they should launch a major research initiative that um, the higher ed institutions should lead on and give them feedback as to what can be done to change that outcome. When they look in the education system, I think similarly, when you look at social programs, um, again, I think there's so many you know, colleges and uh, higher ed institutions there with faculty who are interested in that, but need the support in order to be able to provide those answers and also provide uh, the collaborations and the partnerships uh, to bring those solutions. And I think that there's an opportunity there from a practical point of view that can be done. And, and, and I'll also address the small as well, because the other thing that's clear to me uh, in a more globalized economy is that small is really just relative. And I think small is the box that you paint around yourself uh, versus uh, the size of what your ambitions are. And I think the larger the ambitions, um, I think it, you know, the, the capacity is there because of the globalized nature uh, of our economy and our society today. Dr. Frederick, we have um, one of our listeners is a uh, uh, Howard alum and former faculty member at Howard University, um, Dr. Spencer Thomas, who is also the chairman of one of my counterpart um, schools in Grenada, the T.A. Mary Shaw Community College. And Dr. Thomas would like you to speak to um, the outreach that you've done to other institutions outside of the United States. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> um, I, a couple of things I would say. I, what I have tried to do, I, I've traveled extensively as a result uh, of the job and everywhere I go to a foreign country, I look at those universities. So Columbia, I visited about four universities there, um, South Africa, I'm very familiar with the University of Cape Town, Western Cape, um, in the in the United in United Kingdom, uh, Queen Mary. So at any corner of the globe um, that I've been to, I always go and uh, meet with chancellors, vice chancellors, uh, etc. So so Beckles, um, etc. And what I have noticed is that when I came into the job, Howard had thousands of MOUs with universities uh, that were practically just collecting dust. And so I don't sign MOUs unless everybody is very, very clear as to what the goals and objectives are, um, that we have a mechanism to measure those as we go along and to come back and revisit them uh, to make sure that they have teeth and, and fortitude in terms of what we intended to do and whether they need tweaking or we, they need to be sunset. I'm, I'm also willing to face that reality as well. So I'm open to uh, collaborations with uh, other universities and, and colleges throughout the entire ecosystem, but they must be uh, robust partnerships and, and they must be symbiotic as well. Uh, we don't think we have an, a monopoly of ideas or solutions. 
And part of what makes us better is uh, getting increased exposure. My colleague, uh, Mrs. Michelle Clavery, would like you to say something about unconscious bias in education. Yeah, uh, there's no doubt about it. There's significant unconscious bias in, in academia and in education in general. Uh, I give a talk on unconscious bias in academia and one in unconscious bias in academic medicine. And it's probably the thing that I'm asked to speak about the most. I mean, this spring, I, I was invited to MD Anderson, where I'm an alum, um, to Penn, uh, to Yale, uh, to give uh, you know that very talk. And that's just this, uh, this past spring. And what happens there is that uh, most of us uh, bring our unconscious biases uh, into the classroom and into our research and into our interaction with other faculty members. And a lot of it is based on our prior experience. Now, if we don't stop ourselves long enough to say, well, let me ask another question or let me get myself uncomfortable and get myself into a situation where an uncomfortable question can be asked of me, uh, then I think uh, we start to get ourselves in trouble. And that's, I think, a, a critical aspect of what must happen. The DNA of Howard University is social justice. There's no doubt about it. But when I took, the, took over this job, um, two thirds of my undergrad students were women. And of the 13 schools and colleges uh, that I oversee, the hospital, the TV station, the radio station, there was only one woman dean. And I said to the entire campus that this is wrong. You know, we have to call it for what it is. And so I set about a process um, where everybody had to go for competency training and unconscious bias training before we conducted any search. Before you could sit on a search committee um, at Howard University for a dean search, you had to participate in that training. And that resulted in us getting to a point where we had 10 of the 13 deans were women. Uh, but it, it requires leadership. It requires that you, know, you speak truth to power in that as well. And it also requires that you're willing to uh, expose your own weaknesses, uh, but you, you're willing to turn them into strengths by doing the work that's necessary to get there. Uh, we have, um, I know, I know you with, with time bong, uh, Dr. Frederick, so I'd just like to ask one final question. And it comes from Professor Carl Theodore. And just to give a little background, Professor Theodore is um, one of the leaders in the post-COVID response team that the Prime Minister has, has, um, has constituted. And Professor Theodore asks that as Trinidad and Tobago moves to re-engineer itself after the pandemic, um, do you see universal healthcare coverage as one of our imperatives? And when he suggests beginning with universal health insurance. Yeah, you know, um, and I'm I'm familiar with Professor Theodore. Uh, you know, I, I I'm a little cagey about answering this question because I think th this is a little bit complicated. You know, in the U.S., it's different, and and for the sake of full disclosure, I am a board of director member of Humana, which is uh, uh, the the fourth largest um, health insurance company in America and a Fortune uh, 500 company. So I, I put that out there to say, uh, let's, let's expose any biases I may have. Um, universal healthcare, I think, is critical and must be probably the minimum basis for which we build the rest of our healthcare system. Um, I think the healthcare system in Trinidad is, uh, is an ambitious um, experiment at this point that used to work well, but you have to have people pay into the system. And sometimes when we think about university, universal healthcare, people also think free. And I think the two things uh, are not um, equal to the other. Universal healthcare, you want people to be able to access the system, but you have to pay into it. So whether you collect taxes well, as they used to do in South Africa, and you then pay into the system appropriately, or you charge people a minimal insurance amount that allows them a broader access for which that small premium does not necessarily cover the bill uh, completely. And I think that some hybrid of that must exist. Here in the US, uh, it is extremely difficult because the healthcare system here is predicated on research and cutting edge technology, that investment has to be paid for. 
And that's a difficult aspect of the healthcare system here uh, in the US. In other words, if something is new and shiny, the expectation for the consumer here is that they are able to access it uh, the day it is deemed safe to access it. And if that's the case, and you do something like robotic surgery, uh, we, we bought a robot here at Howard for over a million dollars. And so by the time you do 50 procedures, you've got to charge at a certain amount in order to make the maintenance and all of that. Um, right now, is there another way to get that operation done? Absolutely. Uh, but for the people who want it done um, robotically, uh, the consumer drives that demand. And so that I think tends to upset the apple cart here when you talk about universal healthcare and universal health insurance here, but I definitely think in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, that's a real possibility. Would you permit me one last question, sir? Sure, sure. Yes, this is comes from Mr. Michael Anisette, who is a member of the board of governors of Cipriani. Uh, Mr. Anisette asks, while education is important, how does entrepreneurial development and um, business owning, uh, <clears throat> and blacks owning their businesses and communities as a means of empowering uh, communities. Yeah, entrepreneurship is critical. There's no doubt about it. And I think that it is an opportunity um, if you have entrepreneurship and ownership of businesses, et cetera, where you could really empower blacks in a society. But let's not be, let, let us not be mistaken though. Um, the access to capital is, is what undermines that um, that kind of holy grail notion. Um, where do Blacks access that capital? And do we have structures in place <clears throat> to ensure that we can empower them? We have to remember the serial entrepreneur probably does not hit pay dirt until the seventh venture. Um, how much laxity do you have to fail five or six times? Right? My mother took her savings and sent me to Howard. When I graduated from medical school, if I called my mother and said I was going to go um, into private practice by myself, um, she would probably have a heart attack, right? She would want me to get a safe job and to ensure that I was within the safe structure of an institution, especially having been a public servant herself, uh, to ensure that I got there. And so one of the things that we have to recognize as well is that Blacks in most societies are risk averse. Risk averse from what exactly you need for entrepreneurs, as opposed to my two kids, um, whatever they may choose to do in life, I may be able to say to them, I'm willing to fund you uh, to X amount and willing to fund you in a serial fashion until you get it right. And so that access to capital is very, very different. And I think it is one that we often don't talk about. So yes, Black ownership, Black businesses, I, I absolutely support, but let's be very clear. Somebody has to bring the banks to the table and or start Black banks that are willing to uh, give money uh, to those very people to do that. And, and, and in Trinidad, again, <clears throat> and like I said, I'm, a, I'm a, more of a, a student of history than anything else when it comes to Trinidad and Tobago. So I, I don't like to make assumptions. I try to dive in and read. But I've looked at the credit union system and I think the credit union system in Trinidad is very telling. And it, and it's, it's been an important part of the social structure for businesses, right? So if you go and you look at a Hindu credit union system, et cetera, and you look at businesses and you look at how they've been funded and where, I think you see a lot of interesting things there as well that are very informative in terms of, you know, how entrepreneurship is seen depending on uh, what your ethnic uh, makeup is. Dr. Frederick, thank you so much, sir. Your, um, your commitment to Trinidad and Tobago is unfaltering. And I think that is, a, I think that is the legacy of your, your dear mother. And please wish your, your grand happy birthday from the entire Cipriani College um, community. Uh, I certainly will. And thanks for having me. And like I said, I, I am a product of uh, that soil. And that soil has very, very deep roots. And so I'm, I'm forever in gratitude for the education and the health care and I think uh, the values that were embedded in me uh, by uh, the nation of Trinidad and Tobago. So anything that I could do at any time uh, to be supportive in any way, shape or form of any institution there, um, that I, it's my attempt to pay down a debt that is, is not payable, to be quite honest.
Thank you. Thank you so much. So to all our listeners, I want to invite you to tune in at 2.30 to our uh, women's empowerment as a pillar for transformation of the trade union movement. This is this afternoon at 2.30 and Professor Rhoda Redock would headline that panel discussion. Thanks much and God bless everyone.